to emphasize these four primary lines that are in Daniel's last vision, and I intend to emphasize it a few times as we go through this study, so this concept of four lines gets in our head. It's about four kingdoms, okay? The kingdom of the beast, Catholicism, or modern Rome. Um, this is one of the lines of understanding in Daniel's last vision that we need to see. It's about another kingdom, the kingdom of the dragon, which is spiritualism and the United Nations. And I'm purposely doing this. Sister White will identify the beast as Catholicism, a religious. And then I put modern Rome here in terms of its civil structure. A threefold union is modern Rome. With the dragon, the religion is spiritual. I left an A out of there. Spiritualism. Um, and it's the United Nations. And then with the third kingdom, you have the false prophet, which is apostate Protestantism is the religion, and it's the USA. Okay. But in these three lines, I'll come to the fourth kingdom, which is God's people in a minute. With these three lines in Daniel's last vision, you have a king. Okay. With this kingdom, it's the popes. This kingdom... It's the, it's the king of the south, and it's his struggle. The king of the south, um, in Daniel 11, verse 40, he delivers a deadly wound to the king of the north. And then in 1989, the king of the south has its move from being atheistic France to the Soviet Union. And in 1989-1991, the king of the south is decimated up to the neck. Um, the, the Confederacy is removed, leaving just the King of the South as Russia. And the story of the dragon in Daniel 11 is how the King of the South goes from atheistic France to the United Nations. Okay, there, and there's, so the King is the King of the South. And the King in the uh, false prophet of the United States is the President. Okay. And in these three lines, there's a, there's a struggle that goes on in each of these three lines, okay? In the kingdom of the beast, Catholicism, with the king being the pope, the struggle is between the good pope and the bad pope as identified in the prophecy of Fatima. And Fatima was, Fatima is identified in this magazine. It was understood right from the start, the prophecy of Fatima. Even though it's a satanic prophecy and it's got problems, I mean, it's, there's lots of it, no doubt, that won't come true. The prophecy of Fatima is the guiding, it's what directs the popes and how they, they manage their personal papacies, okay? Pope John Paul II understood that he was the good pope. Uh, this Pope Francis understands he's the bad pope. So their struggle is between each other according to the prophecy of Fatima. When it comes to this kingdom and its king, there is a struggle that is illustrated in Daniel 11. When it comes to this kingdom of the dragon, um, the king is the king of the south, and it also has a struggle. And the struggle is between the king of the north and the king of the south. And when... when you deal with Daniel 11, you need to factor in Daniel 11:14, which says Rome establishes the vision. And we, we put some emphasis on that in a prior presentation here before I left Africa, and I want to maintain that emphasis. Because we weren't careful with applying Rome establishes the vision in Daniel 11, after we understood Rafi and Paneum, we, would, we saw the four Roman rulers, Pompey, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, and Tiberius Caesar, and we thought they were a second witness to these four presidents that lead to Trump, but they weren't. And the argument that allows you to see that they aren't the presidents is that Rome establishes the vision. So you've got to keep that in mind, but here, if you're, going to, if you're listening to me closely, this struggle in the, the period of the dragon, it's about the king of the south. It's the king for the dragon. It's the story of the king of the south. 
But his struggle is between the king of the south and the king of the north. But the king of the north here is not Catholicism. So you might argue, well, I thought Rome establishes a vision. The king of the north here is the representative of Catholicism. It's the United States. So over here, I want to show, remind you of something. We'll come back to this probably in a little while. Isaiah 23 identifies that from 1798 to the Sunday Law is the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And from, in this history, the papacy is forgotten. Okay, she's hidden. She's behind the scenes. And this is an agreement with the story of Elijah, because in the story of Elijah, Ahab's there and the false prophet is there, the false prophet being the priest of the grove and the prophets of Baal. But Jezebel isn't there. In the story of Mount Carmel, Jezebel's off in Samaria. She's hidden. And Isaiah 23 says, in the history of the United States, from 1798 to the Sunday Law, the papacy is hidden. But nevertheless, in the kingdom of the dragon, which is a subject of Daniel 11, that you need to see in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, when it's speaking of the dragon, it's speaking about the king of the south and the struggle that, it's, that illustrates the history of the king of the south is a struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north. But the struggle is with the representative of the king of the north, which is the United States. Okay, and this is based upon Daniel 11 verse 40 in, in the rest of the chapter. But still, um, Rome establishes the vision because in 1984, the United States has become connected uh, with Rome. It's been conquered, essentially, spiritually, by Rome in 1984 because of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, as a professed Protestant, and every Protestant, if you go back to the beginnings of every major Protestant church, you can find that the people that were used by the Lord to raise up those particular churches all identified the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And so too with Ronald Reagan's Protestant religion. His religion knew in the beginning that the Pope of Rome was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, but Ronald Reagan said that he came to understand that the Soviet Union was the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, and therefore he was willing to enter into a secret alliance with the Pope of Rome to bring the Soviet Union down. And this connects with Sister White's statement that all those that become confused on the meaning of Antichrist will ultimately end up on the side of Antichrist. And you, if ever you strike some kind of an agreement with Satan, you've just been overcome by Satan. And the Bible talks, speaks to this principle that by by whom, oh, whomever you're overcome by, he, he becomes your ruler. So in 1984, the papacy took control of the United States uh, with the, the um, appointment of an ambassador by Reagan to the papacy. And therefore, that, from this point on, the United States becomes the representative of the King of the North. And, and sure enough, that's the way it played out in Daniel 11, verse 40, as we understood it. And I'm saying it plays out all the way to the Sunday Law, where both the king of the south, Russia, is going to come to its conclusion and the United States is going to come to its conclusion and the king of the south then is the United Nations and the struggle that has gone on between Putin and Trump at the very end of this period of time, it will be Trump that prevails and becomes the leader of the king of the south, the leader of the United Nations. So this is the struggle. That's a story in Daniel 11 of the dragon, and then there's the kingdom of the false prophet of the United States, and the king, of course, is the president, and there they have a struggle too, and the struggle in in their history. And, and by the way, I left one thing out: when it comes to the point of reference in the dragon for the struggle between the king of the north and the king of the south, it's Daniel 11. And what I'm saying is when it comes to the point of reference for the struggle for the beast between the good pope and the bad pope, it's the prophecies of Fatima. Okay, so when you get down here to the United States, this kingdom, the struggles between the Democrats and the Republicans, and the point of reference is the Constitution of the United States. Okay, so you have 
three struggles that are going on in, in these three kingdoms that are in Daniel 11, 40 to 45 and in Daniel's last vision. And the three struggles always have two opponents, good pope, bad pope, king of the north, king of the south, Democrats, Republicans. And the points of reference are Fatima, Daniel 11, and the Constitution of the United States. Okay, and there's all kinds of stuff that come out of that. Um, and, and what I'm saying is, is until we get familiar with these lines, it'll be a little bit trickier to really apply the lines of prophecy that are in Daniel 11 to verse 40 and 45 without some kind of confusion. So that's why I'm taking time laying this out. And then the fourth kingdom is the kingdom of the 144,000. This kingdom, the 144,000 perfectly reflect the character of Christ. Sister White is clear on that. And in the time of Christ, Christ came to set up the kingdom of grace. But in the history of the 144,000, Christ comes to set up the kingdom of glory. Okay, and this is a subject of the Bible, whether you're aware of it or not, there's a kingdom that's set up. In October 22nd, 1844, Christ went into the most holy place to receive a kingdom. Okay, that's part of the story, not just to begin judgment, to, but to receive a kingdom. And the, the point of reference for this kingdom of God's people is that because they are, are representatives of Christ, if that's the way to say it, Christ was a prophet, a priest, and a king. So in their story, you have three lines, and you will see a struggle in each three lines, okay? The story of the kingdom of the 144,000 44, in terms of their fulfillment of being a prophet as typified by Christ, and the 144,000 reflect Christ's character perfectly, is the story of Elijah. In the story of Elijah, you see the struggle between the false prophets, which are twofold, man and woman, that parminder and tess in this movement, okay, with an, uh, with an unholy emphasis on a unholy relationship, which is just what they are promoting. Um, and so this, there's a struggle here in this story. And, but this is the history of the priests. This kingdom is a history of the priests. And, and I'll go one step further than we usually do. You, in a generic sense, you can even include the Levites as priests. Okay, so... When I'm saying priest, whether it's, the, as we understand it, the priests and the Levites, or both classes as simply the priests, I'm putting the parable of the ten virgins here because I'm not sure how to express this struggle, but it's, it's the work of dividing those two classes to foolish priests, wise priests, foolish Levites, wise Levites. There's a struggle that goes on. There's a struggle here. And then the king, um, Jesus was a prophet, a priest, and a king, has to do with establishing his, his throne in Jerusalem. And you can show that Ezra 7.9 says that Ezra gets to Jerusalem at the midnight cry. Okay, but we've taken time in this study bef before we went to Africa to show that the history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law is duplicated in the history of the Sunday law to the close of probation. Both of those are image of the beast testing times, first in the United States, then in the world. In that regard, Jerusalem is the midnight cry, and this history ends at the Sunday law, but it goes to the close of probation. So Jerusalem can be here, but it's also here. Okay, this is, this is when the priests are lifted up as the ensign for the Levites, and this is where the priests and Levites are lifted up as an ensign for the Nethanims. Um, but Ezra gets here on the first day of the first month in Jerusalem, and for many years now we have demonstrated 
that when the Lord is choosing Jerusalem, and that's what I'm saying He's doing here, um, Isaiah 2, He's choosing Jerusalem. It's going to get lifted up as an ensign. Look at Isaiah 2. Um, we, I'm sure we all know this, but um, verse 1 says, And the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jeru Jerusalem. Jerusalem, there's a point here where Jerusalem gets lifted up. This is the end sign. This is where Ezra gets to Jerusalem, and all nations are going to flow through it. And later on, Isaiah says, how does he say it? No more strangers shall pass through her forever. Okay, so this is, this is what we would call the church triumphant. It's the wheat and tares have been fully separated forever. But we would also say that um, this is the point where the kingdom of glory is being established um, on planet earth okay as the king as the kingdom of grace was established in the time of Christ okay and when when was the king of kingdom of grace established in the time of Christ when was the kingdom of grace established in the time of Christ the cross no the yeah, cross well, the triumphal entry is the cross, okay? And this is the cross, and this is the cross, is it not? Because the Sunday law is the cross, okay? Here, the kingdom of glory is being established. So there's a story here about the kingdom of glory being established, but there's a struggle, because what we've taught is right here, as Jerusalem is being chosen for the final time, this is God's kingdom of glory, what's also happening simultaneously. <laughs> Jerusalem is being destroyed. Jerusalem is being destroyed and Jerusalem is being chosen at the same time. This right here, Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to join hands with the rest of the Protestants in passing this Sunday law and they will fully cease from being God's chosen people. It's even more over here, I acknowledge that, but that's what's going, is there's a a pass, a fully, a full passing by of the former covenant people. Okay, and the former covenant people were Jerusalem until this point in time, and now the Lord is choosing Jerusalem for the last time, and He's establishing His kingdom of grace, glory. So, what I'm saying is we have to see these four lines. They all have kingdoms that you watch, kings that you watch, and they all have their own specific struggle that is part of the, the story of Daniel 11. And the point of reference for the struggle is Fatima, Daniel 11, and the Constitution of the United States. And we'll spend more time on this, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, um, Daniel shared a quote in his sermon on Sabbath, I think, or maybe it was in Sabbath school, but it's a familiar quote. I'll paraphrase it. Daniel's always afraid to paraphrase things. He'd like to say it perfectly, but I, I don't mind paraphrasing him. I can be corrected later. But and it's, she doesn't just say this one place. She says it several places, but he has a special one that he goes to where the... The events that took place at the cross are reenacted at the end of the world, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it, it's just black and white. And although there were a lot of, there were a lot of classes of people at the cross, the two main categories were, and these, both these, both of these classes beat me up on how to spell them, 
Okay, this is the Sadducees. Is that how you spell Sadducees? That's how I would spell it. Good, that makes me worry. I think it may be two D's. Okay, there may be two D's. And Pharisees, is that, is that how you spell Pharisees? Okay, there may be two D's. I'll try it. You think so? Okay. Yes? I don't think so. It don't matter. We get the point. This, these two primary classes, they don't get along with each other at all. But when it comes to the cross, they're going to come together to crucify Christ. That's the point that I want us to see. Yeah, it is two D's. Two D's, okay. And the point, one of the points that you can demonstrate about the Sadducees is that they are liberals in a negative way and the Pharisees are conservatives in a negative way. Neither one of these are positive attributes, okay? Christ was liberal and it was positive and Christ was conservative and it was positive. There's a way to be positive in both of those things and I know that makes you, you I see your look, that you're saying Christ is never conservative because you're never going to find um, an, a place where Sister White puts the word conservative in a positive light. Um, but there is an element of conservative that has to do with the word conserve and he was seeking to conserve mankind from being destroyed forever. That, that's all I'm saying. I don't, I don't want to get off into the, the semantics of it, but what I do want to show, if I can, is that this is going to be repeated. Did you find that quote? Yep. What, what, what is it? The Read reference, it and then you can read it. Okay, the reference is uh, 5 B.C. 1106. The scene transacted in Jerusalem at the betrayal and rejection of Christ represents the scene which will take place in the future history of the world when Christ is finally rejected. The religious world will take sides with the first great rebel and will reject the message of mercy in regard to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay, so this is, this history is repeated and one of the things that is part of that history is that liberals and conservatives come together. This is the place they come together to put Christ on the cross. Okay, so in these three stories, these three lines here, in the context of Catholicism, this is a conservative pope and this is a liberal pope. Um, this would be a liberal uh, political system this would be a conservative political system. These would be liberals, and these would be conservatives. So it's not an accident. When you see these three lines, which are the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet that lead the world to Armageddon, that they all have their own internal story about a struggle that takes place in their story, and it's always about liberalism versus conservatism. Here it's religious liberalism versus religious conservatism. Here it is political, and here it is political. Okay? So that can't be an, a an accident upon the testimony of two or three things established. Yes? Just so I understand, you're putting the king up in the kingdom of the dragon and spiritualism as Putin and Trump. You're listing them as the two players there. Yes. And yet you're taking them down there as the kings also of the false prophet. You're just putting Trump there, or you're not putting Trump at all, or that's an internal of the dragon. I'm trying to figure out your king for the false prophet. The king for the false prophet is the president. It's Trump, okay? It's oh, Trump, just Trump in but, his but his internal struggle is about the Constitution, and it plays out among Democrats and Republicans. So then and, your constitution, wouldn't that be in there, the living constitution? Yeah, well, that? this would be the living constitution. This would be original intent. Original intent. But it's, it's more than that. I'm just giving the basics. 
the Constitution identifies executive. So it's about a government system, basically. Yeah, that's that's part of the Constitution, judicial legislative. and legislative. So it's all of these, like I said, this is just an overview to start introducing us to these concepts. All of these, these stories are much bigger and broader than is being outlined here. So, you know, you got Trump here. If time would last, and we know that it won't, the Democrats, without some type of unexpected intervention, the Democrats are finished. Because Trump has so stacked the Supreme Court and the court system now that it'll take a genera probably two generations to purge it from conservatism. It's just, and the few liberals they got left on there, one of them is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and you know, she's just moments from the grave. So he'll probably get another opportunity before he's, and right, right now. All the way down to the lower courts too. All yeah, he, he, yeah. He, yeah, you look at the lower courts. He's been, he's, he's already changed the ninth, the ninth Circuit, which was the most liberal in the world out in California. He's already changed that. Um, and then you got your legislative and what they're going on, what's going on now, of course, we don't want to get into politics. But it seems like it, it's either going to be Bernie or Bloomberg. And if it's, it's Bloomberg, he, he, he doesn't seem to have the personality to stand against a Trump. Trump will just chew him up and spit him out. And if it's Bernie with his communist propaganda, what I'm saying is it's pretty, it seems pretty clear that even if there wasn't a nuclear strike in July, that Trump's going to be reelected, and when he does, on his coattails, which is the expression they use in politics, he's going to take back the House of Representatives. Okay, it, it's, it's going to get totally conservative, but in America, almost any country, I assume, but in the United States, if you have a nuclear attack in July, number one, it's legal by the Constitution for the president to disband the election. Okay, as did the first Republican president. And I don't know if he disbanded the election, but he, he implemented habeas corpus and martial law in the Civil War because of a war. So you got that beginning and ending where Trump, at minimum, can begin a dictatorship. Um, he could disband the election, but, but even if he didn't disband the election, Sorry, it's a landslide if you've just been hit by Islam and you're going to vote between Bernie or Bloomberg or Biden or whoever or Hillary uh, and Trump, Trump gets reelected. All right, that, that's a, a given unless he falls over dead, which Bible prophecy doesn't seem to indicate will happen. Okay, so I, I, I need to put these concepts in place as we move forward so we can familiar, familiarize ourselves with these concepts. This is, this is old information. We'll come to it in a minute. I still want to finish off some stuff on time in the end. So if you would, turn to Daniel. Let's begin with uh, Daniel 9. <clears throat> Daniel 8, I'm sorry. This is, maybe I'm making a, one of my bad assumptions, but Sister White says Daniel 8, 14 is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. So I'm going to agree with Sister White and say that Daniel 8, 14 is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism at the beginning. But I'm going to say that at the end, the foundation and central pillar of Adventism is verse 13. And I can get away with doing that because they're the same verse. The 13 and 14, you can't separate. One's a question, one's an answer. But verse 13 is where we find Palmoni, the wonderful number. And verse 14 is simply the answer to how long. 
and so this is, these verses are just central to everything that we understand about this message. And in verse 15, let's read verse 13, 14, and 15 to put into context. Verse 13 says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, that certain saint is Palmoni, the wonderful number, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the vision, in verse 13, how long is the vision? It's concerning two desolating powers, the daily and the transgression of desolation. That's paganism and papalism. And it's, those two desolating powers are going to trample down two entities, the sanctuary and the host. Okay, so how long is asking about duration? Uh, the Adventist theologians say you can take that Hebrew word that's translated as how long and understand it to be when, because they don't want to deal with duration. They want to try to uphold October 22nd, 1844 as a point in time, but they do not want to deal with the fact that this verse is asking a question about both the 2300 and the 2520. So they try to destroy any thought of duration, but that, that's not my point. In verse 15 it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, and that word vision there is hazon, C-H-A-Z-O-N, however you want to pronounce it, and sought for the meaning, then behold there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And that word appearance is mare, okay, because that's what mare means is appearance, and hazon means complete vision. So notice what Daniel is sought, seeking the understanding of. He's seeking the understanding of the Hazon vision, okay, the complete vision. In Daniel 8, the vision begins in verse 2. Okay, you got an introduction in verse 1 about what year it takes place. And then in verse 2, a vision begins. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was in Shushan, in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes and see, saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. So he sees this vision of the ram, the goat, the horn, uh, the little horn that's going to oscillate between a female horn and a, a, and a male horn. And then by verse 12, the vision's over. Verses 2 through 12 is the child's own vision, his own vision, however you want to pronounce it. And then he hears this heavenly di dialogue that we just read, how long shall be the vision concerning this. So in verse 15, Daniel's saying, I want to understand the prophetic history of the complete vision, the child's own vision, the complete vision of verses 2 through 12. I'm seeking for the meaning of that. That's what verse 15 is saying. And it came to pass, verse 15, when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the Hazon vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And it's the Mare vision. Daniel wants to understand the child's own, but Gabriel's told him, told, make him understand the Mare vision. Okay, so you have to understand what the Mare vision is. And you can see both of the visions, the Mare and the Hazon, in verse 26. Verse 26 says, And the Mare vision of the evening and the mornings which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up thou the Hazon vision for it shall be for many days. The Hazon vision is the complete vision. It's, a, it's the vision of a period of time. That's why it's for many days. But the Mare vision is the vision of the evening and mornings, and it's simply the appearance. Okay, and this expression evening and morning is found repeatedly in God's Word. It begins in Genesis. It says, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Everywhere in the scriptures where you see the, this Hebrew expression, which I think is O-R-E-B, Oreb, and 
Bogar, but I could be right, B-O-G-A-R, Oreb and Bogar, something like that. Everywhere you find that in the scripture, it's translated as evening and mornings except for one place. And the fact that it's there so many times, always translated as evening mornings, except for one place, it makes that one place a very special place. And the very special place where it is not translated as evening and mornings is verse 14. In verse 14 it says, And he said, said unto me, Unto two thousand three hundred evening and mornings is the actual Hebrew, but in the King James Version it's unto twenty three hundred days. Okay, the point being is, in verse 26, it says, And the mare vision of the evening and the morning, this proves that the mare vision is the vision of, of verse 14, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. On October 22nd, 1844, Christ is going to suddenly appear in the most holy place. And I say suddenly, based upon Malachi, where the, the messenger of the covenant comes suddenly to his temple, and Sister White says this sudden appearance in the temple, based upon Malachi, is identifying that it was not understood that it was going to take place. And the Millerites did not understand that Christ was moving into the most holy place. He suddenly appears in the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, in fulfillment of verse 14. And this is the Mare vision. And the Mare vision is what Gabriel is told to make Daniel understand. Even though Daniel wanted to understand the vision of prophetic history, the Hazon vision, the Lord said, no, I want you to understand the Mare vision. Okay, everyone with me? Amen. This is old, old material. Um, so, go back to Gabriel's job assignment. Uh, verse 17. So he, Gabriel, came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Okay, so we're dealing with the time of the end here, and this vision is the Hazon vision, the complete vision. Okay, the, it's the vision of prophetic history. And Gabriel's saying, understand this, that the vision you want to understand about, the Hazon vision, it's going to be sealed up till the time of the end, to 1798. Verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time of the appointed, the end shall be. Okay? There are two indignations. What are the two indignations? The two twenty-five twenties. And now, Gabriel's going to do his job assignment. He's been assigned to make Daniel understand the Mare vision, the appearance of Christ, on October 22nd, 1844. And Gabriel first says, okay, the Chow Zone vision is sealed up to the time of the end. And then he says, I'll make you understand what shall be in the last end of the indignation. If there's a last end of the indignation, what must there also be? a first end of the indignation. So if you have two indignations, one ends in 1798, the 2520 against the northern kingdom, and the other ends in 1844 against the southern kingdom of Judah, which one is the last? The 1844. So Gabriel is saying the last indignation, the 2520 that ends on October 22nd, 1844, is what I'm showing you, and why is he showing him that? A second witness for October 22nd, 1844, which is the Mare vision. He's giving him a second witness, and what I want you to see here is that in verse 19, it's the last, the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. So October 22nd, 1844 is the time appointed 
and it's the end. And what is the, um, the Hebrew word that is translated as time appointed? Moed. M-O-E-D. Okay, Moed. It means an appointed time. And so, remember that. October 22nd, 1844 is an appointed time. And we've looked recently at Daniel 11.24. Go to Daniel 11.24. We've been speaking about Daniel 11.24 and the Battle of Actium, the struggle between Augustus or Octavius Caesar and Julius and, and Anthony and Cleopatra. Verse 24 is speaking about pagan Rome. And the last phrase says that pagan Rome will rule the world even for a time. And that time began in 31 B.C. at the Battle of Actium. And it ended in the year 330 when Constantine dif divided the kingdom into east and west. And Uriah Smith informs us that when you get to verse 27, that the time that's under discussion is that time prophecy. And verse 27 says, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. The end of the 360 years is a time appointed. Verse 29 says, And at the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. The time appointed is the end of a time prophecy. Okay, so we've got three witnesses here going for, actually, if you count verse 17 of Daniel 8, that the time appointed is the end of a time prophecy. And then in verse 31 of Daniel 11, pagan Rome is going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. At the very end of verse 31, it says, And the arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary's strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they, the arms, shall place the abomination that make it desolate. They place the abomination of, that make it desolate. They place the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538, and then begins the 1260 years of papal rule. Um, and verse 33, speaking of the persecution, says, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. Those days are the days that Christ refers to in Matthew 24, except those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved. Uh, that's the 1260 days. And then in verse 35 it says, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So the time of the end is interchangeable with the time appointed. So October 22nd, 1844 is a time appointed. We've already seen that. The year 330 is a time appointed. 1798 is a time appointed, and they're all times of the ends. Time, time yeah, it's an appointed time too, but we never knew that way back when because we, had, we didn't see the 126. We would have still said it was the time of the end, but, but we thought it didn't qualify fully because it, there wasn't a time prophecy connected with it, but there is. There's a 126. But my point is, is 1844 is a time appointed, and it, therefore it's a time of the end. Everyone with me? Okay, so we're dealing with the definition of the time appointed, and now this, this, these three lines on top, not the bottom line. You just said 1844 is a time appointed, but also a time of the end. Yeah, so they're interchangeable. interchangeable. Okay, yes. go ahead. Yeah. yeah, do you see it? Yeah, no do you see it? I see it. Okay, you need to see it. All right, so... Now, this is a different study, but it, I'm serious. You, I'm serious. I don't mind emphasizing it with her. You need to see this with where we're going. That, and this is where we're going with this. There's three things that I want to bring out of this, and this is an old study. Okay, this is an old study. This is what we call the pattern of Christ. Okay, and over here, um, I, I shouldn't have put it that way. I should have put it this way. Um, well, anyway, this is the pattern of Christ. This is 4 BC. It's the birth of Christ preceded 
by the birth of John the Baptist, two are born to mark the time of the end. And then there is 30 years. The 30 should probably be centered here. This 30 years is the 30 years that Christ is alive until he comes to his baptism. Okay, that would be here. Um, and this would be 27 A.D. 31 and over here, 34. Okay, when he's baptized, he's going to Now it's correct. It wasn't correct. All right. When he's baptized, he's going to give his, his godly testimony for how long? Three and a half years. 3.5 years until he's crucified. And then he's resurrected. And then he ascends. And then in AD 70, you have the destruction of Jerusalem, which Sister White among other things, applies to the close of probation um, and the introduction to the seven last plagues. The destruction of Jerusalem can also represent the Sunday law, but Michael stands up when the Sunday law becomes universal. So this would be the universal Sunday law here, when probation closes. And then in A.D. 100, you have John receiving the revelation and Sister White says something like this. She says, In the early Christianity, Christ came a second time. His first coming was at his birth in Bethlehem, and his second coming was at the Isle of Patmos when he gave John the revelation. If you type those words in, you can pull up the quote. So this is the second coming here that's being prefigured by Christ coming to John at Patmos. Okay, this is the pattern of Christ. And the pattern of Christ governs the pattern of Antichrist. And this is one of the things that we must remember. Okay, when, when Parminder and Tess took all the worldly people and all the young people out of this movement, one of the primary reasons they got away with it is because no one was really familiar with what the foundational truths were any longer. And this is something that we used to teach on a regular basis. And it is airtight. Okay? And one of the things that I want you to see out of here, if you will, is that this is a godly pattern. This is the pattern of Christ through his walk in human history. But this pattern is going to be used to illustrate the pattern of the Antichrist, an ungodly walk through human history. Therefore, when we're over here on this board and we're looking at the good pope and the bad pope and the king of the north and the king of the south and the Democrats and the Republicans, it is not out of character with biblical prophecy to see that these unholy struggles between these two elements are reflected in the kingdom of the 144,000. Okay, so, such as we've already shown before we went to Africa, that Pope John Paul... What did you just say? What did I just say? That it's, it's an agreement with prophetic application that all these, this is an un unholy kingdom, unholy kingdom, and an unholy kingdom. This is the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. This is a satanic kingdom. Modern Rome, they come together threefold, but if you look at them separate or together, they're still unholy. But in these stories that are in Daniel 11, I'm saying those stories are going to parallel history of the 144,000, which is holy history. And that this presentation here is giving justification for that happening. So what we've already put in the record previously to going to Africa is that the, these two popes, that the, the first pope that at one line is John Paul II. He's the 
the white pope or what the Catholic Church would call the good pope. And this current pope is the, the bad pope or the black pope. Okay, and that's based upon the prophecy of Fatima. And of course, Daniel, who's always trying to throw a clinker into the situation, he asked me yesterday, well, what about Benedict? Okay, Benedict's in between these two. But Benedict had to be there in order for the Fatima prophecy to be, how they understand it, fulfilled. Okay, and so what you have is John Paul II and Benedict are pretty much the same pope. They're both conservative popes. Benedict was a, an apologist for Pope John Paul II. And Benedict has to be alive so he can come out of retirement to fulfill this Fatima prophecy. But what it does is it teaches you that when this unholy line is brought down to the holy line, that there will be an issue about a leader that has died and is resurrected. Okay, you follow me? This gives that witness as well. All right, you have a question. Yeah, I do. I just want to make sure I have it in my mouth. Doesn't the, the um, Christ line always governs the, the satanic line? Uh, that's the way line? that I, th yeah, that's... They, okay, so they, if, if, it didn't, if it didn't line it up, then you wouldn't have the right way marks in the Yeah, satanic that's probably line? true. What I used to teach, it, it, this is where you probably heard that, is that this is the point of reference, is Christ's line for all these other lines. You can put more than these lines here, and we haven't even dealt with this one. This is the point of reference. So I would teach it that this is the, the, the one that would govern it, point of reference. But I don't know how accurate that is. I mean, if this line is holy and this line is unholy, it really don't amount. They're interchangeable. Right? They should line up. They'll line up, yes. And up. if they don't well, line up, then maybe you have something wrong. Yes. Yeah, if you have to decide which is which, I think I would go with Christ. Oh, yeah. yeah, if that's what you're saying, yes. What you're saying there is, is the reflection of Isaiah 14, where Lucifer wants to be like God. I will be like the Most High. I will, I will ascend into the... He wants to be the King of the North. All that's of this is a reflection. All comes from that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So... The pattern of Antichrist is, okay. When you say unholy line, <clears throat> I don't think that's correct. All right, I don't it want to say unholy line because the line is sacred. It is. It's a holy line talking about unholy men. So the line in of itself. The line is solid. divine. Even if it's talking about unholy men. But it is governing also unholy entities, whether it's a man or a kingdom. So it wouldn't matter if the prophecies of Fatima, was, if Christ was on top or Fatima was on top, if the line's holy, it's holy. Right. Okay. okay. Everyone's straight? Okay. Keep me in check. So 508 is paganism being removed fully in order for the papacy to rise, but it takes 30 years for the papacy to rise to 538. Now the papacy is going to give its unholy testimony for how long? 3.5 years. And in Daniel 11, um, in verses 6 through 8, is it? We have a 35-year period, remember? Yeah. That lines up with this. I just want to throw that in there to remind us. That ends in what? 246, peace treaty in 252, and begins in 281. Yes. Okay, so anyway, 3.5 here again, and that's lining up with the 3.5 that Christ gave his holy testimony. The papacy's given an unholy testimony for 1260 years, and then the papacy receives a deadly wound right where Christ received his deadly wound. But Christ is going to be resurrected and then ascend. And I, I never used to put it this way, and, and I'm open for correction, but I'm saying the resurrection of the papacy takes place at the midnight cry. Because the United States now is past the first Sunday law, which is the mark of the beast. It's not Daniel 11 verse 41, but it's coming back to life. But at the Sunday law, the papacy ascends to the throne of the earth, and it's going to have 300 and... 
60 years from AD 31 to 330 until it falls. Okay? And what we're saying here is that, just to be clear, of course, this is papal history. Let me do it over here. We're saying that Balaam strikes the United States three times, right? First time, 9 11. Second time, Midnight Cry, 18, 2020. And then again on December 25, 2021, in this history. So this is Balaam's, Islam's three strikes. Yes, everyone with me? But here we're saying nuclear, nuclear. Here it's just kamikazes, okay, which is part of the story. But this history here, from here to here, we're saying it typifies this history to the close of probation. The close of probation is the final fall of Babylon. Yes? Yes? Yes. Okay, so here is the the fall of the United States. This is the Sunday law in the United States. This is where Balaam and the donkey both fall down, yes? Okay, and this is the image test for the USA. And this is the image test for the world. And we've noted characteristics here and here that line up with characteristics here and here. Say amen if you know that. Okay, so this third strike of Islam here in the United States would be typifying what? A strike down here, would it not? And I'd even go so far to say that it's a nuclear strike. Is it? Why would it be a nuclear strike? If the first two are nuclear... <laughs> Can't well, the first two aren't. Well, the well, first one is not nuclear. No, but the no, other two are. I said, if, if the... I'm, I'm sorry, the first... If the... Those this is a Sunday law. Yeah. This is a Sunday law. Uh -huh. And this is the universal Sunday law. Yeah. So you might think this is nuclear. You need got a second witness for it? Go with me to Revelation 18 as we bring this to a close. I didn't finish off that line there of the French Revolution. But um, one thing at a time. Let's start in um, verse 6, 5. Because I, I want to spend time tomorrow or the next time I present on the first four verses. Because I'm, I'm going to argue that the first four verses are applied to the Sunday Law, Daniel 11, verse 41. And they're applied to the Midnight Cry. And they're applied to 9-11. These four verses, 9-11, the earth's lightened with His glory. At the midnight cry, the earth lightened with his glory. And at the Sunday law, the earth lightened with his glory. And, and I want to go in and, and try to show what I mean by that. But there's a judgment that takes place that begins in verse 5. It says, For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This is Babylon, modern Babylon. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and that in the cup which she hath filled to her double. How much hath she glorified herself and lived deliciously? So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues come in one day. And you're going to see as you read down here that her plagues, Babylon's plague, come in a day and an hour. Okay, which kind of like Second coming terminology, no man know the day or the hour, but her plagues are going to come here in a day. Death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. She's going to get judged with fire. And everyone's going to see the smoke of her burning. And what do they do? Standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, 
that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, Islam. But why aren't you racing to the fire to put the fire out? Why, what kind of fire do you keep away from as the smoke goes up? Nuclear fire. Yeah. You don't race in to a nuclear holocaust. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and of purple and in silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat. Pardon me? I'm blocking my microphone. Not a problem. Um, verse 15. 15, I'm going to pass, jump down there. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, woe, woe, Islam, Islam. That great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so rich, great riches has come to naught. Verse 18, And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? So I'm just saying that when we're considering that this history is repeated in this history, this history ends with the second nuclear attack on the United States, I'm saying Babylon comes down with some kind of judgment that is fire and smoke that no one wants to get next to. They stand afar off and, and look at the torment. Okay, but back to here. I want to, I want to at least get through here. Um, so at the midnight cry, the papacy's coming back to life. Uh, I would even go so far to say that, I won't, go, I won't say it, but before the midnight cry, we have this date of May 14th. Okay, I think this is one of the steps of her coming back to life too. Uh, some kind of agreement struck here. Then this Sunday law, then this Sunday law is where she, she becomes the head of the threefold union. She rules till she falls, which is lining up with AD 70. This resurrection and ascension is lining up with Christ's resurrection and ascension. And the second coming is the second coming as typified by Patmos. And you're preaching the sermon on Sabbath? Yes? Yeah, I guess so. Um, so I can continue this tomorrow? Okay, so I'll, when I come back tomorrow, I'll take this up right here and put the French Revolution and Revelation 11 into this. But the three things that I want to point out about this, and we'll bring them together tomorrow, are, one, that it is correct prophetic application to recognize a, a holy history that is paralleled by an unholy history. Therefore, when we're seeing the history of the good and bad pope, or the king of the north and the king of the south with the dragon, or the Democrats and the Republicans with the false prophet, that those lines can be brought into the kingdom of the 144,000, and the waymarks will line up and teach a story that needs to be seen. Okay, so that isn't just twisting anything. This is... This type of prophet, prophetic application we've been doing for years and years. Um, the, there was two other things that I wanted to, to say about this, and maybe I won't, it won't pop in my head till I get through the French Revolution. Uh, oh, the other one is this. Yes, good on me. I'm glad I didn't forget it. This is one of the punchlines that I have to put in place about the time of the end, okay? Is 508 to 538 a time prophecy? Is it? Okay. 
based upon Daniel 12, from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up shall be 1290 days. But it's broken in half or broken in part by 30, 1260. Everyone know that? Okay, so what is the end of a time prophecy? It's a time appointed, is it not? Right. So is 538 a time of the end? Yes. Yes. yes, okay. So was 27 AD a time of the end? And yesterday we discussed it, but now I'm going to rediscuss it. This 1260 days, prophetic days, from Christ's baptism to the cross, does that make the cross a time of the end? Yeah. Yes, on several witnesses. So this is a time of the end. This is a time of the end. This is a time of the end. Therefore, 1798. Is 1798 the time of the end? Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're, I want, it, want us to see that the end of a time prophecy is the time of the end. So would 34 AD be a time of the end? Yes. It's the end of what time prophecy? It's the end of 70 weeks. What else? It's the end of the last week. What else? It's the end of the last half a week. There, there, you can show three time prophecies coming to inclusion in AD 34. And what happens in AD 34? Michael stands up. Okay, AD 34 is also the close of probation over here if you can follow the logic. Yes? Yeah. Because Michael's standing up. So I wanted, to see that, wanted us to see that. And that was the second thing. It's giving me the justification I need to apply the lines in Daniel 11, which having a starting point of time at the end that may seem a little bit odd at first glance to someone that isn't familiar with the time of the end. The time of the end is a time appointed. Um, that really accentuates that, that statement you read yesterday from Sister White, they don't understand the time of the end, man. It, yeah, when to locate the messages yeah. or where to locate them. Yeah, the time of the end. And so they, they're often left filled. Um, Okay, maybe the only other thing I wanted to say, there was three things for sure, but it may be about this, okay? And I, and I know what it would be. And, there, and I'll tell you what it is, and then we'll deal with it tomorrow. I always struggled with this line and this line. This line is the French Revolution, and it's a line of the Old and New Testament. And right here in this story, we'll look at it tomorrow, the Old New Testament are, they receive their deadly wound. But how long are they in the grave? Three days. Uh-uh. That's how long Christ is in the grave. Yeah. Very three, three and a half. Three and a half yeah. days. And that's what I always struggled with. Christ was in the grave for yeah. three days and he's resurrected and then ascended. And here, the Word of God, the Old and New Testament in the French Revolution, they're in the grave three and a half days. And it was always... A struggle for me and then I realized something that well maybe the way to do it probably the way to do it is that there is a death in AD 34 of the bride it's divorced but there's also a marrying of a new bride the, the, gent uh, the Christian church so there is a resurrection here and the Christian church is then lifted up and ascends as it carries the message to the world. And if that's the case, then this would be three and a half, the same as the three and a half down here. Okay, so we'll look at that tomorrow. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many wonderful lines of prophecy that you've given us through the years that speak to the very um, issues at hand. And uh, as I'm bowed before you at this point in time, I remember the third thing, and I want to put it into the prayer. I thank you uh, that the, the line of Christ, the line of Antichrist, 
the line of the French Revolution and the Word of God are identical, thus proving that this Catholic concept of dispensationalism is absolute foolishness. That you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you govern the providential leadings of your people from beginning to end with the same footsteps that you've always taken. So we thank you for, for our study this morning. Ask for a blessing upon our day's service to you. In Jesus' name, amen.